Um, so hi everyone, um, as has been said, I'm a PhD student. I'm actually based at Curtin University, but I do my work at the Australian Plant Bank. So I'd like to acknowledge that I work with people from a number of different organisations. Um, and what I'm going to be talking today about is both my work and the work that's been done as part of the Rainforest Seed Conservation Project. So the work being done by myself and also my other colleagues at Plant Bank, including a lot of the tissue culture being done by Amanda Rollison. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that Plant Bank stands on Yandalora, which is a traditional meeting place of the Darawal, the Darug and the Gundungurra peoples. And I acknowledge their ongoing custodianship of the lands, uh, waters and skies of the areas in which I live and work. So we've heard a little bit about exceptional species today by both um, Karen and Amelia. Um, these are the species, as being said, that do not survive that storage, um, or the seeds don't survive storage in um, traditional seed banking methods. Um, Pence and others have put together some characteristics, um, different categories of those types of exceptional species. And you'll notice a lot of these characteristics we see over and over again in those Myrtaceae species that are affected by myrtle rust. Um, so this could be an issue of seeds not being produced, whether because that is just not what that plant does. It might be a fern that doesn't produce seeds, um, but it be, could be because that plant is no longer producing the seeds in the wild as a result of other factors going on, whether that's fragmentation, the pollinators are no longer there, or those plants are being affected by myrtle rust and no longer producing seed. Um, or it could be physical characteristics of the seed, um, things where they're not surviving the drying or the freezing or um, other conditions of storage. Or it could be that those seeds can be stored, but we can't work out how to get them to grow. Um, then we're not able to get them out of their dormancy at the other end. Um, and obviously we're gonna need uh, alternate conservation strategies for these species. We can't just stick them in a seed bank. So when I talk about biotechnology, I'm talking about tissue culture and cryopreservation. And both these methods allow us to have medium to long-term storage of different types of plant material. And both these techniques have been used for a range of different species, um, beginning with agricultural species and now moving on to the conservation of wild species. Um, and they have different benefits and, and difficulties with both of these um, uh, concepts. So beginning with tissue culture, it has an extremely long history of use in agriculture and it's been used for the maintenance of um, particularly important cultivars or strains. Um, and it's also used for the production of large amounts of plant species or large amounts of individuals. Um, and we're now moving into the conservation of wild species and we find in particular that it is much more difficult to get woody species into tissue culture. Um, and we've got issues as well with our exceptional species. At Plant Bank, over the past decade, um, with the Rainforest Seed Conservation Project, um, work has been done on 18 different species, so they're split over two pages, um, so from a number of different um, genera, and we can see that there's quite a, a, a range of their susceptibility to myrtle rust. This project began not with myrtle rust in mind, but fortunately we've managed to collect a lot of that germplasm of those susceptible species. And we've had success with 15 of these species. And you can see we've got quite a large number of those Syzygium species um, that Karen mentioned are very sensitive to drying and can't be stored in the seed bank. So the tissue culture process is, is quite difficult. It's not a matter of just taking a cutting and sticking it into jelly. We wish it was that simple. Um, so we'll have um, element of choosing what sort of plant material we're gonna use to initiate uh, those cultures. This could be just dependent on what is available. So um, whatever we can get, we will try. Um, but we might be using seed to capture a lot of genetic diversity in our collections, or we might be using embryos from the seeds if those are easier to clean, or we might be using cuttings. And this is probably the most common method that we use for initiation of plant material. We all then have to go through a process of sterilization, and this can use a number of different solutions, um, but the idea is to get that plant material clean into tissue culture. Um, we've heard this week that there are plants that require those fungal and bacterial communities. They have a symbiotic, rea symbiotic relationship with them in the wild, 
Um, but once in tissue culture, that's the perfect condition for those bacteria and fungi to take over, and we'll find our entire collection will be taken over by contamination and we lose the plant material. So we have to get our plant material clean to get it into tissue culture. We then move on to the basal medium or that agar jelly that we're using. Because these plants are not growing in soil, we need to provide all the nutrients they need to grow. So we need to include the macronutrients, the micronutrients, the vitamins in that jelly media. And we might also include um, plant growth regulators to promote different sorts of growth in that media. Um, and different plants like different media, and sometimes even different individuals like different media. So there is a lot of work that goes on to um, determine the, the, best, um, the best media to grow those plants in. And there's a lot of regular maintenance involved in these collections. So we've heard about the maintenance of plants in living collections, in pots and in the soil, um, but we also have regular maintenance of these tissue culture collections. So as they use up all the nutrients in the media, we need to move them onto new media. And this happens typically between six to eight weeks. Um, there's a new culture. Um, some species we're able to leave for a little bit longer, up to four, four to six months. There are other individual plants that would like to be subcultured every couple of weeks if they could get it. Um, there's a lot of work involved in some species. Um, so the benefits of this um, process, we can maintain these cultures for a really long time in a sterile environment. So once we've got these plants in tissue culture, they're no longer going to be affected by pest species, by disease. So this buys us a little bit of time for those of you working on um, cures and other options um, to, to save these species from myrtle rust. Um, we've got those species held safe um, in culture. We can also use this material to multiply um, up and that we can use in other experiments. So um, you've already heard from others about how some of our tissue culture material has been used for genetic analysis, and we also use it in restoration projects, and as I did for my research, using it in cryopreservation studies. Um, so what is cryopreservation? Um, it's been used uh, once again in the agricultural industry for a range of different germplasm types. So depending on the species, you might store different types of material. Um, one important thing about it is that we do need to desiccate the material, so to dry it down and to cryoprotect it so that it will survive in those very cold temperatures. So if anyone has ever accidentally left a lettuce at the back of your fridge and it's frozen solid to the wall, you go to pull it out, the water in those cells has expanded, has burst the cell walls, and you end up with a soggy mess that you don't want to put in your burrito. Um, so the same thing happens for our plant material when we put it into cryo storage if we haven't done that pre-work. Um, so we need to make sure that that material can go in, but that we can bring it out and grow it again. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, so the cryopreservation process is, is quite complicated. Um, each of these steps can be changed in so many different ways. Um, but basically, the pretreatment and the loading um, steps are involved in removing some of that water. So desiccating that material in a way that um, there is less water in the cells to break the cell walls, um, but also wanting to make sure that we don't kill off that plant material. Um, we then put in some cryoprotective agents. So these could be um, glucose, different types of sugars, um, different types of chemicals that replace the liquid in those cells and maintain the cellular shape and also promote vitrification, which is the process of um, turning the liquid into the cells into a glassy state when it's frozen, so we're not getting those spiky water crystals that break the cell wall. We then put it into liquid nitrogen, drop the temperature right down. We typically use vitrification protocols, so this is where we store the plant material either in droplets, you can see that uh, in the little tube, droplets of cryoprotective agent or in the liquid itself. Then we bring it out of liquid nitrogen, we want to warm it up, we want to wash off those cryoprotectants because often they can be uh, toxic to the plant material, and then we put them into recovery. So every step along the way, lots of things you can change, lots of things that can go wrong, <laughs> lots of things to test and work out the optimised process for. Also, when we're talking about exceptional species, um, we often have very low seed or other plant material available. Often it's not in the best of condition. 
and we can have rapid loss of quality in storage. So this gives us a very small window of time in which to do our experiments and means that often we have quite low replication, which anyone working in science knows is not ideal, but it's just what we've got to, got to work with. So at Plant Bank, um, we've worked on eight different species so far for myrtle rust. Um, we've got species that have been worked on um, as part of the Rainforest Conservation Project, and then six species that I've worked on as part of my um, PhD research. We've looked at different germplasm types, um, but today I'm gonna just talk about three species that I've worked on and the seed work that I did. Um, some of them you can see I also did shoot tip work. So one species is um, the Bacchausia, so lemon myrtle. This species has extremely low seed fill and it has reduced longevity in storage. So it doesn't survive for long temperatures in the, uh, long time periods in the seed bank. Um, I looked at eight different treatments. Oh, we've got some formatting issues there. Sorry about that. Um, and I used a droplet vitrification process, which is where we put the seeds in just a little droplet of cryoprotectant. Um, these graphs um, have survival in the light colored bars and regeneration in the dark colored bars. Survival was whether those seeds or other plant material looked healthy after uh, two weeks after it had been taken out of this process and regeneration if it, if it went to, on to produce a root and or shoot. Um, so if it began that process of recovery. Uh, the treatments that are noted with a snowflake are the ones that went into liquid nitrogen. Um, and you can see from this graph that um, we had quite, quite a lot of variation in the survival of different species, which was mainly driven by uh, the, the pretreatment. So it was the drier seeds that survived better after storage and only the drier seeds that, that then went on to regenerate, um, which is what we would expect. Um, and you can see these little seedlings on the plate. So these were seedlings that went into liquid nitrogen. Unfortunately, they didn't continue to grow for um, much longer than a few months after this treatment. So we've still got some work to do to look at recovery um, of the species. But this is a species that doesn't like growing in tissue culture. So that could also be the issue. Um, the native guava, obviously we've heard it's no longer producing seeds in the wild. Um, we've got 12 different treatments that I looked at, um, so looking at a number of different um, parts of that process. Um, this one was a little bit sad. We had no recovery at all after um, storage in liquid nitrogen. However, we saw that for the treatments that didn't go into liquid nitrogen, if the seed survived, it likely went on to regenerate. So that was really good to see that those desiccation treatments and those cryoprotective treatments weren't causing any toxicity issues, that those plants were able to grow on. So now it's just a matter of looking at how we can improve the process and hopefully get it into um, cryo storage. Our last species, the, the lily pili, Highly um, abundant species in urban environments, but threatened in the wild. Um, this species, I looked at 20, 20, sorry, 46 different treatments um, over a number of different experiments. Um, and this is only the results of one of those experiments, but it's quite typical of what I saw. So I saw very high survival after two to three weeks. So I saw green cells, that plant material was still alive after all treatments. However, it didn't continue to stay alive and we had very low recovery rates. So there's still quite a lot of work to do for this species to get it um, surviving after cryo storage. But that little image that you can see, that little tiny uh, embryo or embryonic axis from the seed growing out of an, an artificial seed, it's encapsulated in alginate, starting to grow, that's what we want to see. Um, one of the issues we had with this species was contamination, particularly from the wild species, um, which brings us on to um, potentially a lot of these species we need to work with shoot tip cultures rather than seed. Um, so some of the things that we've learned, um, collaboration, communication are the key, um, working in, hand in hand with our nursery staff, the people managing those living collections for us was essential, making sure that we're collecting plant material and initiating it at the right time in its life cycle so that it can grow um, has been really important. Um, for tissue culture, we found that growth from um, seedling material is much easier um, than from uh, mature plants that we've taken cuttings from. And for cryopreservation, we've got a lot more work to do just to improve some of those recovery rates. Um, and as Karen mentioned, using the DSC to get a better idea of what's going on inside that plant material. Um, 
So I'd like to thank the funding sources of this project and um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. And uh, I have a big question because I'm working with the microbiome of the seeds and plant tissues. How do you check that your cultures are clean of endophytes and they don't contain any bacteria or fungi, okay. especially intracellular? Yeah, we see it. It comes out very quickly. <laughs> so the plants let us know very quickly if there is bacteria or fungi in there. It grows often within a couple of days of us putting that plant material into culture. Those, um, the plates that we use, the agar jelly contains sugar. It's a nice humid environment. The bacteria and the fungi, they get going very quickly. Um, so we'll see halos if there's bacterial, fun uh, bacterial contamination, often endogenous. So if we've made a nice clean cut and then within a few days we see a little halo coming out, we know there's still bacteria in that plant. Um, sometimes the plant will survive through it, but often it then takes over the whole jar and the fungi comes out almost immediately um, and will very quickly take over the entire culture. I had to remove some photos, but I've got some great photos on my laptop of contamination if you want to look at them. Um, I just will say that your plants won't be free of fungi or bacteria. They'll still be in there, but you've got rid of all of the ones that grow out on the media. But just so that everyone knows, tissue culture is never clean. It always has stuff growing inside it, but just not the stuff you don't want for long-term storage. Yeah, but poten it potentially. But some of these collections will be held for decades and we don't yeah. see anything else coming out. Yeah, no, they won't, they won't grow out, but they have a... There is some that do not come out and from biosecurity that becomes a risk because people think tissue culture is clean and will take it over but it's not always clean it's just it doesn't grow what's in there is not growing out okay. which is good for you i'll ask a question um, then another... uh, if i may um what perspectives do you see for um, uh, capturing that endobiome and uh, storing it uh, separately in the same way that uh, orchid uh, mycorrhizal associates are uh, stored uh, alongside but under separate uh, regime from orchid seed? Yes, it's not really something that I've looked into. I'm definitely not uh, from that sort of background. Um, but it's definitely something that could be looked into further. So um, Bob's talking about the way that some of those fungal cultures can be saved and isolated and then stored in, um, in cryo storage as well. Um, it's not something that we've looked into, but potentially if more work is done on the ecology of some of the species that we're working on, so we know which are those important <laughs> fungi and bacteria, then that is something that we could do in the future.